Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lion Burger Construction and Berglund Center, where live entertainment lives in the Roanoke Valley. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. Our guests are major players in the local craft beer brewing scene happening in Roanoke. Will Landry is co-owner and head brewer of Twisted Track Brew Pub. Brian Summerson is the majority owner and head brewer at Big Lick Brewing Company. Both got their start with the Star City Brewers Guild, which is now 25 years old. And gentlemen, thanks for joining me today. And uh, I uh, have to say I've done a lot of field research at both of your establishments, so we're going to talk about the Star City Brewers Guild and all that, but just talk about uh, how you got started brewing beer in the first place. Uh, uh, Brian, why don't you go ahead and start? Um, I actually got my start with the Star City Brewers Guild. My wife and I moved here um, to Roanoke probably 22 years ago. Uh, my wife taught with a lady whose husband was in the Brewers Guild, took me to a homebrew club meeting, and I was hooked and mm -hmm. took it from there and ran, and but started out with pot on the stove and a bucket for a fermenter. <laughs> and I've got giant stainless steel right. toys to play. Huge, yeah. yeah. What about you, Will? Um, we, my wife and I moved down here in 2005. Uh, at that point, there really wasn't much in the area. I think the closest brewery or brew pub was about two hours away. And there certainly weren't the great bottle shops that there are now in the area. So if you really wanted any craft beer, you had to make it yourself. So I think I joined the, the club in uh, the end of 2006 or beginning of 2007, and uh, it's been a, a ride ever since. So. I have to bring up, it was the General Assembly did something, was it 10 years ago or something? They changed the rules so that, which made tasting rooms <coughs> legal or... Correct, yep. It was the uh, only reason we were able to open. Right. Um, basically didn't have to serve food any longer in your tap room, so. Was that, okay, that was the criteria, okay. Yeah. Although you, oh, although, uh, well you serve food. Yes, yeah. sir. And you have people coming in with food from. Correct, across the street. And right, so, but that was a big change. And after that happened, the scene just really exploded. Yeah, there was a boom. And I think, <laughs> yep. I think now Virginia's in the top five in brew pubs in the country or something like that. They shot up with a rocket or something. Yeah. You know, it was a good change. Mm -hmm. um, both of you sort of, you talked about the Star City Brewers Guild. Talk about what the guild is and how that helped get you, you guys off the ground and a lot of the other local craft brew pubs around here. They're 25 years old now, the Star City Brewers Guild. Yes. Sorry. Well, basically it is a group of individuals who, who like beer and, and brewing. Um, I think most of us also like to cook, so brewing and cooking are a lot alike. Um, but <clears throat> basically they have monthly meetings, generally at someone's house, mm -hmm. occasionally at a brewery or brew pub. Um, focuses on teaching, tasting. Um, the Star City Brewers Guild has quarterly competitions, so we pick four styles at the beginning of the year, and then everybody would brew, everybody who wanted to enter their beers, and then they would, we would judge them, sit down, judge them, and we would have winners. And it was good because you got a lot of feedback, which is important. Um, on your beer and how to make it better. Right. Um, but, you know, lots of, we helped with microfestivists um, as volunteers and judges for that. I don't think they do microfestivists anymore. They have it in several years. Okay, no. I poured at a couple of them, mm -hmm. it was nuts. Yeah. In a nutshell, uh, Will, mm -hmm. how many steps is it to brew a beer? How many pots do you need, that type of thing, like if you were a home brewer? I mean, it can be as simple as a one pot uh, exercise where you're using a, a, a liquid or a dry malt extract um, and some hops, uh, moving that to a, a fermenter and adding some yeast, and it can be that simple uh, to get a, uh, an alcoholic product. Mm -hmm. um, from there, you can either uh, put it into bottles with a little bit more priming sugar or into kegs for serving, and it can be that simple. How long does it have to ferment? And do you, do you refrigerate it when it ferments or what? Uh, ideally, you want some temperature control, not necessarily refrigeration at you know 36 degrees. Right. But uh, if it's a, a lager, uh, typically those ferment around 55 degrees. If it's an ale, uh, closer to 68, 65, 68 degrees. Uh, there are now some yeasts where they do better at higher temperatures, but they're few and far between. Um, typically, a lager might ferment in 10 to 14 days, maybe. Uh, an ale could be as little as four to seven. Okay. So like an IPA, and you guys both make great IPAs. I'm a big hazy IPA fan. Mm -hmm. How long would that take to ferment? 
Uh, four to seven. Yeah. Okay. Four to seven range. And there's a bit of aging, you know, when you dry hop, that takes a couple extra days, um, you know, and then kind of crash it, we call it. So, uh -huh. we, so all those hops drop to the bottom of the cone so we can get them out of the finished beer. What's a dry hop as opposed to like a <coughs> wet hop, I guess? Well, hopping happens during the boil, generally. Um, different times during the boil gives you different things. Um, at the start of the boil, you get bitterness. Towards the end of the boil, you get flavor. Um, now there's whirlpool hopping, they call it, where you're done boiling and you, if you're able to, you get your um, wort spinning and you add hops and that's pretty, pretty good for flavor and aroma without adding bitterness. Mm -hmm. And then dry hops come after or during fermentation where you throw them in there and that's where you really get the aroma oh, okay. from that. So, so pretty much every hazy or regular IPA is at least dry hopped once sometimes. Yeah, because they're very distinctive ro aroma and I like, I like the aroma. How do you mm -hmm. get the hazy? in the IPAs, the, 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 the New England style. How do you get it to be hazy? Uh, a lot of that has to do with the yeast that you use. Uh, certain yeasts uh, don't, what's called flocculation. Uh, a higher flocculation will be a clearer beer. Lower flocculation will stay in suspension. Mm -hmm. uh, that is part of it. And then the timing of the dry hopping also plays into that. Uh, there's some other things like um, having oats or wheat in the grain bill that contribute some haze as well. So it's a kind of combination of those three things. How long did it take you guys to really master the art of brewing? Well, Brian, I'll start with you. Um, like I said, we had the competitions, so I, I'm a competitive person, so I entered every single okay. one that we ever had. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, just doing that over and over and over. And, yeah. and like I said, we, we didn't, didn't drink a whole lot at our house, so I always had beer on tap, and, you know, we'd have people over, and, you know, people were like, why don't you sell this? You should sell this, and, you know, and you're like, yeah, sure. But, you know, and then eventually, you know, I started entering the national competitions and stuff like that, and that's where you really get the good feedback. And, mm -hmm. and then going and seeing other people brew, you know, people who were in the guild before I was, um, and that kind of stuff, and just practice, practice, lots of reading. Um, that, I'm just wondering, some of the beers that are in the Star City Guild competition, do, do, do some of the brewers that are still involved with it, do they sort of use that as a test market to see whether or not it's worth brewing big batches of? I mean, have some of the beers out of the competition wound up at local brew pubs that uh, you know not of? Not that I or know Or some of. version of it. Well, we've had like, um, we used to early on, the winter of each quarter, we would brew at the old Big Lick, um, you know, so long as it fit in our schedule. Right. So we would scale it up to two barrels, which is, you know, about 14 times bigger than a homebrew batch. Mm -hmm. um, but not so much anymore. I think different, different competitions, they allow the winner to brew their beer at some local brewery or brew pub. What, what has the local uh, craft brew pub scene done for, for the Roanoke Valley? There's been a few that have come and gone, fall by the wayside. That happens in any business sector. But as far as even bringing in people regionally uh, and, and being written up in magazines and all that, what has what that meant? I'm sure you have people come in all the time from out of town or mm -hmm. uh, you know, the region or something. Let's start with uh, you, Brian. What has that mean, meant for the area, do you think? I, th I think it's been a boom. Um, you know, the Hotel Roanoke has been really good um, as far as turning people on to the local brewing scene. I know they um, send people up our way all the time. Um, but just, I think, nationally, it's a, it's a thing. So people, it's part of their vacation plans. Um, when my wife and I go somewhere, we generally sure. want there to be a decent brewing scene, mm -hmm. particularly Asheville. We go there all the time. Um, but yeah, it's just tons and tons of people. We get people who come in their campers and park in the parking lot overnight and, mm. you know, on their way through. So, yeah, it's really been, I think it's helped out the valley quite a bit. Mm -hmm. You see some of those people come from out of town? Yeah, very much so. I think it's, it, it, it's true. I think we've got, um, well, with Roanoke going away from the, the train or, or rail uh, as, as the, the prime employer in the area, um, you know, Roanoke City, at least, and, and part of the county has made it clear that, you know, between the hospital and Carillion and Virginia Tech and tourism, that's their new bread and butter. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, there's a, certainly a symbiotic relationship between people who enjoy outdoors and craft beer. Um, it attracts a younger crowd, too. It does. The, the, that demographic, that, you know, 25 to 40 ish range. Um, really enjoy craft beer and the outdoors, so it, it just makes sense to, to try to expand craft beer. You know, it seems to me as much as anything, the craft beer, the brew pub scene, it's not about people going out and drinking 15 beers. It's people going out and have a couple of beers. It's just meeting, mm -hmm. community. It seems like, you know, 
it's a type of meeting space where you can meet up with people or say hi to someone you haven't seen in a couple of months or something. But mm -hmm. it, talk about that. That's got to be one of the really good things is that it really you form communities at these places. Yeah, we do. And live music, I think, is a big part of it, too. I wanted to bring that <coughs> up, too. Um, old Big Lick, we couldn't have live music, just, you know, as guitarists. But, you know, that was one of my big major things I wanted when we kind of scaled up. Um, but, you know, so that brings out people just to come out and enjoy some live music. Um, many, many groups get together. You know, we've got, both of us have good-sized tables where, you know, groups of 20 can come. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of professional groups come, um, have meetings <laughs> yeah you know, so you know we have a little event room and that's rented out quite a bit mm -hmm. um so yeah it's it's quite a meeting place and um, downtown's pretty vibrant right now we have 170 apartments next door right in west station so we you know we have that crowd so. right mm -hmm. not to mention a thousand apartments so a ways away and i know that um you do a lot of music at twisted i've seen like Ritter. isaac Haddon there i saw mm -hmm. uh, william seymour a guitarist there a few mm -hmm. weeks ago um, and uh, it, it, just, it seems like it's opened up a lot more venues for people in, in the Valley, these brew pubs. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think getting back to your, your previous comment, I think, you know, a, the tavern mentality has always been a gathering place in any town from colonial days to, to modern history. So, yeah, to get to, to be able to get together and share ideas and catch up with people. Um, you know, for us, we've got the ability to allow you to have a, a good meal at right. the same time. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's been a, 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 a missing piece or, you know, something that, that any major city should have. Um, what was it? And what was the question again? I'm sorry. I missed oh, it's okay. I, you know, I wanted to ask you, you, <laughs> you, you, you mentioned the kitchen yeah. when you took over from Soaring Ridge, which was, they did not have a kitchen. What yeah. made you make that leap of faith to do that? Um, that was something that we had talked about from the very beginning. We wanted to have, we, we knew there was a missing, um, business model, if you will, for a brew pub in, in town. Uh, Three Notched is, is here. They do have food and drink as well, um, but uh, another, at least another space. So it allowed us to get a restaurant license, which allowed us to also uh, have cider and wine available to, uh, to our customers. And that's something that we had seen work at, uh, even limited at places like Barrel Chest to do some tastings and Three Notched, and then uh, obviously other places around the, the state and the country. So did you need to have uh, uh, the license for food in order to s have cider or wine? That's correct. That's just an ABC idiosyncrasy? Yeah, yes. So we're licensed as a manufacturer, so we can't serve anything but our own product. No. Really? Um, yes. yes. The so restaurant license allows you to... Okay. Open. Okay. So you're a manufacturer of beer. <coughs> we are, but we're, so are we. we're working on it. We have two. Okay, ones. you are. Yeah. Meanwhile, you've got people from Tuco's coming across the street mm -hmm. all the time with orders and Beamer's 25 next mm -hmm. door. So it seems like yeah. you've got to create the whole ecosystem around... Uh, we're, Big Lake. we're working on a brick oven pizza con concept at the place. Yeah, so. How long do you think that's out? Uh, several months at okay. least, probably. I'm sure that's some herniations to go through, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Not so bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about the type of beers that people like. I'm, I'm a big hazy IPA fan. It's funny, I never drank IPAs until the hazies came out because mm -hmm. the West Coast were, a lot of people like them. They're just a little too bitter for me, but. Um, uh, what are some of the beers, we'll start with you, Will, that people are really are gravitating towards now? I think that's, that's the, the, the most popular right now is a hazy IPA. Uh, obviously, you know, 10 years ago, it was just a West Coast IPA. I think like you and many other people, the hazy IPA gets you the less bitterness, but still has some, a lot of flavor characteristics to it, mm -hmm. uh, the fruit that, that people like. Uh, that's our best seller. I assume that's probably gonna be most breweries' best sellers these days. Um, the other thing that sells really well for us is whatever we have for a light beer. We usually have uh, either our slightly twisted light lager, uh, or I've got a Will's Pills on right now. Um, people seem to enjoy some light beers. It's right. kind of a transition beer, they call it, for people who have grown up on you know, the Bud Miller Coors and are, are trying to get into craft beer. Right. It's a good crossover. Which I think is great. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then other than that, you know, our, a West Coast IPA we always carry, that sells really well. Um, and then everything else, um, you know, kind of sells at a, at a slightly less pace, but right. pretty consistent across the board. Right. And I know as we go to taping, uh, White Bronco's going to be hitting the streets <laughs> yeah. again soon. That's, that was one of your first beers. That's a, a hazy IPA, and you've had some different iter iterations, uh, Brian, but that's, just a, that's, that's a big one for you guys. Yeah, I mean, like he said, hazy IPAs, we, we'll joke and say they pay the bills yep. and everything else, you know. 
Right. You know, but we also have, we have our Smith Mountain Lager, um, which we distribute almost all of it, you know, so there's very seldom any left for the, for the tap room. Mm. Um, but we have uh, Italian Pills, it's real popular. Um, tomorrow, maybe even today, we have um, a Fest beer coming out with some malt from Germany that's pretty hard to get. Um, and we actually got to brew it with some German students from the Technical University of Munich came and got to brew that beer with us, so that's kind of cool, and that's a lighter kind of mm. fest beer. You know, I wanted to ask you about that. I think it was last summer or late in the spring where Virginia Tech has a brewing program, and they had a bunch of students from Germany over, and they were touring. Yep, and we um, just had them, what, two weeks ago? I think it was. Um, okay, do they make the rounds in the area? Yeah, they do. They, they are, I think they're in the U.S. three weeks, um, okay. so they do lots of things, but they visit many of the pu different breweries and, you know, get to get in there and get hands-on, and they're, they're very technically knowledgeable, um, Germans, most of them. of course, yeah. Yes, <laughs> you know, we learn stuff from them all the time, yeah. and they enjoy it because they have the rang spot, however you say it, where they're only allowed to use malt, hops, yeast, and water. Um, so they're fascinated by us, you know, even just the fact that we throw in, you know, a, a clarifier into the work to help clarify it. They're not allowed to do that. Okay. Um, so that, you know, they, they think that's kind of cool and gives them uh, yeah. some different experience. So there are actually things that, uh, by law in Germany, whatever, they cannot put in their beer, huh? Correct, yep. Okay. So I'm just curious when you, you know, these German students come over when they take a sip of your beers and they mm -hmm. give it the thumbs up. It's got to feel pretty good, huh? <laughs> yeah, it does. And yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty neat, and you know they get a good perspective from all the local breweries, and, and so you know it's it's pretty cool for them to get to get a flavor of Southwest Virginia. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the it, the uh, and I've heard this from other local craft brewers. A lot of you guys know each other, mm -hmm. and uh, is there still some sort of camaraderie as far as you know sharing of tips or 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 anything? Uh, is it is it still pretty? Uh, you know, con congenial mm -hmm. among all you guys, for the most part. Very much so, in my opinion. I mean, I, I think we've 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 got a what is it? Facebook uh, group of all the brewers in the area that we, you know, can can either bounce ideas off or say, hey, I'm short a bag of a certain grain, and anybody have something I can borrow. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's there's definitely a friendship there and a and a community, if you will, that that. We, has come along either from the guild or just from being in the industry for as long as we have been. Mm -hmm. Same thing for you? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, but I think we're all super busy, so we don't necessarily get together right. as much as we'd like. But, but I yeah. know when a few old goats got off the ground, they had some issues and <coughs> uh, Andy and the guys from Twin Creeks actually came over, over to them and helped mm -hmm. them out with whatever they were doing. And they came up with some beer that wasn't quite right, but they sold it anyway and it was a big hit. So. Yeah, you know, that happens. That happens sometimes. Yeah. Oh yeah, you they, guys will put out beers like that once in a while, maybe with a disclaimer or something. Or yeah, and I, I'm, I'm not big on pilot batches. I'll come up with a recipe and just go for it. Roll right into 15 yeah. barrels of it. Just gamble, huh? <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it's hard hard to mess it up too bad. Yeah. yeah. But isn't it true, like every batch of White Bronco or whatever, uh, you know, beer is big at uh, Revolution. It's always a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, it's there's a lot of. You know, there's ingredients, first of all, can be a little different. Um, process might change slightly. Um, and then, you know, yeast is a living thing, so it's going to do its thing. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, there always is. And like with White Bronco, we're always messing around. There's new hot products. There's um, liquid products now where with hot pellets, you lose a whole lot of beer because it soaks into the pellets. So oh. in a 15-barrel batch of White Bronco, we probably dump two, two and a half barrels down the drain. Really? Full of hop sludge. But now these new liquid hop products come out, and they're very expensive, but they smell great, they taste great, and they save you. You get a better yield. Yeah, you get a much better yield. Really? So it's interesting. So yeah. the, the hops, when they, they're mm -hmm. regular hops, just kind of soak up like a sponge. Yep. And, they, and when you crash it, like I talked about earlier, all that drops to the bottom in a cone, and then you dump it out down the drain before you package. Yeah. And, and you know, they soak up a good amount of, of your wort. Well, that's interesting. And the, it seems like the liquid hops are... Quality-wise, this is as good as the other hops. Yeah, and that's the thing about the difference in the batches. So you know, you, you have to get used to that. Then, if you mm -hmm. add that into the process, and um, so yeah, it's it's constant learning. But you know, right? Try to keep it fairly consistent. Sometimes it's a bit brighter than other times. The flavor. And Where do you guys source your hops from? Are any from Virginia? Are they all out of state or out of country? Or how does that work? Uh, we don't get anything currently from Virginia. We or are trying to look for 
for some options that are, are possible. Uh, we were just approached by someone, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but they're local, I think Floyd. Okay. Um, the hops industry in Virginia is really just getting off the ground. Right, okay. right. A um, lot of hops are, um, what do you want to call it? Um, only certain places are allowed to grow them. So, well, that's, yeah, so like all the sexy hops are proprietary. So, oh, okay. So yeah. most of them are in the Pacific Northwest. Depends on climate too, I guess, or big part rainfall, of it. that type yeah. of thing. Yeah. Well, is rain are rain good for hops or? Um, I think they prefer a little bit drier. Yeah. Um, you know, not soaking rain. Definitely, I, I had four I grew in my backyard, and they did okay in Virginia until I eventually got tired of messing them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mowed over them, but they're yeah. they're pretty. I don't want to say easy to grow, but they're prolific once they get going. And really? Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, talk about your journey, uh, Brian. When you started out with Big Lick, it was uh, Norfolk Avenue. It was mm -hmm. really a nano brewery. I think your tanks were about yay big or something. Yep. And then t taking that leap of faith, rehabbing the or renovating the old uh, uh, Habitat store space, mm -hmm. uh, keeping some of the old, you know, yeah. architecture so you could get some tax credits but mm -hmm. talk about that leap of faith was there just something at the time that you felt that the craft brew industry in Roanoke was ready for you to make that leap I, I believe so like you know the original idea of Big Lick um, my wife basically was tired of me spending money so that I should start <laughs> making money so I had a cousin who was a commercial real estate agent and I just kind of bounced it off of them and they got real excited about it and had just built bought that building and kind of took it and ran, you know, I was picturing a kegerator with three picnic tables, you know, in a, in a room. Right. So, you know, so he kind of took it and ran with it. I probably would have continued to teach and drag my feet if it hadn't been for him. But oh. anyhow, but you know, that, that went so well, um, thanks to that HBC, whatever it was, where they eliminated the food. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, right off the bat, boom. So, you know, it, it was a pretty fast ride from the beginning and trying to keep up and and that kind of stuff and we had a three-year lease and you know at the end of that we knew we wanted more space I think right we were in 1500 square feet there uh, wanted some outdoor space so um, originally looked at down at Dr. Pepper Park um, that didn't work out are oh, the building that they renovated next door um, actually one of the unrenovated unre ones under the bridge behind, oh yeah behind. that area's got a lot of potential I've told yeah. Wayne at that you know and mm -hmm. and, um, and people uh, that own it and then uh, that fell through or didn't officially fall through, but then Bill Chapman got in touch with me about the current building and had architecture plans and all that stuff and kind of just blew our minds. And <laughs> oh, we did? Okay, so he yeah. was already a step ahead of you, huh? Yeah, and so, you know, he brought it to me and presented it to me, and I was like, heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it was, it was, you know, basically we started Old Big Lick on a retirement fund that I had that really wasn't doing much, and a couple of partners threw in a couple thousand dollars each. Okay. But so when we moved up there, you know, big loan <laughs> mm -hmm. for big equipment, and you know, so that was the big leap of yeah. faith. I knew people would come drink beer. Right, right. Roanoke is like that, but, but just scaling up and, you know, having 20 employees and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Because I wasn't a I wasn't a business person before that. What were, you, what, what were you teaching in school? I was a second grade teacher. Oh, wow. School at the end of my street, Grandin Court. And okay. So it was, a, it was a leap. I mean, I, I, I went to college and I worked for Foot Locker. I was a manager, so I had some- Managerial with managerial, adults. Yeah, with grand, yeah. So. yeah. But yeah, it was, it was kind of, it's all kind of a lure. And I have a partner, Chuck Garst, who's good with the technology and all that mm -hmm. aspect. I talked to Chuck, yeah. And fix anything and build anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that was good to have that person to lean on. And also, you know, uh, Will at Tr Twisted Track, he took a leap of faith too, getting yeah. into the business, taking over from Soaring Ridge, putting the kitchen in. And so I guess, did you see that there was enough room out, room out there for growth, even with other players in the market for, for Twisted? I think so, yeah. I mean, we wouldn't have done it otherwise. Um, you know, I, I had. I had a few years of uh, professional brewing from at, at Chaos Mountain down in Franklin County under my belt. Um, I had several partners, uh, two of which were avid home brewers, um, and we all saw it as an opportunity to do this brew pub business model and, and try to capture a different niche of people. And uh, the fact that we opened during the pandemic uh, was more that we already had the ball rolling right. and didn't see a sense in sitting on it for any length of Think time. Think of it as a long, soft opening. Sure. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, we changed a couple of things in the plans, but not too much. Uh, mm -hmm. 
We've got about a minute left, so just uh, uh, talk to, to this. If someone hasn't been to a brew pub, even if they're not huge beer fans, why should they come check it out, whether it's for the music or the food or the camaraderie or what? What's the best thing about it being the brew pub business? Well, I think there's, and they do too, lots of events. There's yep. music bingo, trivia. You don't have to drink to play music bingo or trivia. We have a running club that meets on Tuesdays, bicyclists that come on Wednesday. So there's just stuff to do constantly. Um, we have Angels of Assisi comes down regularly for dog adoptions and mm -hmm. um, you know it's just a good place to get out and be seen and you, mm -hmm. know, you don't have to drink to do that but yeah, I think it's a laid-back atmosphere I mean it's very friendly very cordial and everybody's welcome I don't think it's you know there's there's anybody that, that should be shied away or concerned about feeling put out I mean even if you aren't necessarily a craft beer drinker right. we'll help you find something whether it's beer wine or cider um, it's not the same as a bar scene. That's it's sure. exactly. It's not def definitely not a bar scene. Uh, very much more laid back. All right. Yeah. We're gonna have to leave it there. Will Landry is uh, with Twisted Rack, uh, Twisted Track Brew Pub. Brian Summerson, majority owner of Big Lake Brewing Company, and Will and Brian. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm Gene Moreno. This is Business Matters. Thanks for joining us.